probably early in my career, I had a lot of trouble with wanting to air out frustrations and creativity in everything I did. Yeah. Right. So it was, uh, it led to like good friends going, are you ever not aggressive? (laughs) Are you ever not an asshole? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to meet with recording professionals to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Joe Baldrich, a producer, a multi-Grammy winning and number one charting engineer with over 25 years experience in production, recording, mixing, artist management, and brand and artist development. Joe has over 300 album credits on allmusic.com, and he has received a nomination for 2014 Record of the Year for his work on Taylor Swift's Red and won a Dove Award for production work with Toby Mac. Joe also teaches at Belmont University right here in Nashville, Tennessee, having joined the Audio Engineering Technology Department at the Mike Kerb College of Entertainment and Music Business as an adjunct in 2010 and as a full-time lecturer in 2013. Joe brings to teaching his creative experience from working with such artists as Kelly Clarkson, Keith Urban, Eli Young Band, Jake Owen, Dirk Bentley, Toby Mack, Taylor Swift, The Newsboys, Brooks and Dunn, and Third Day, to name just a few of the many artists that he's worked with. I've known Joe for 20 years and have always had a huge respect for his production and engineering with many of my favorite bands going all the way back to the 90s, like Self, The Cadies, Flick, Bobby Bear Jr., and Fleming and John. Joe has made many more records than we can ever possibly talk about in one podcast, but we'll dig in anyway. I'm super excited to have Joe Baldrich with us today on Recording Studio Rockstars. Joe, are you ready to rock? I am ready to rock. No, dude, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock! That's what I'm talking about, man. (laughs) So, you know, honestly, when I talk about producers that I know that make great rock, you're definitely one of them. I mean, I was introduced to you through... Your work, well, through mutual friends, but the work that I heard you doing was all about rock. I mean, you know, Bobby Bear Jr., Flick, the Cadies. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're going to have to dig in and learn some secrets of rock from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, growing up in Illinois and jumping off of bumper pool tables, listening to Cheap Trick Dream Police was a big moment. So, uh, yeah, had a large impact on my sensibilities. So Nice, dude. Um I like that you brought bumper pool into the podcast because we grew up with the bumper pool table too. Was yours all trashed and destroyed and like it was missing all the rubber bumpers around around everything? By the end, it started out brand new and we had like this, uh, I think it was called sound design, uh, record player, eight track player, and it had the lights that were beat sensitive. Oh, sweet. The yeah. color, like the rainbow lights yeah, and stuff? Yeah, yeah. So it was almost like perfect. You so know? you were just rocking yeah. out first before yeah, my you buddy had to do a, anything. Yeah, my buddy had a strobe light, so forget about it. Dude, that's awesome, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to spin a question at you that I haven't used much. Actually, I may have never used it. Uh-oh. You ready? You're going to be the first to answer it. Nice. So, you know, I've done an introduction, but we want to learn more about you and, and how you got into all this. Tell us, what did growing up and, you know, first getting into music smell like to you? Oh, I like it. So like uh, that sense, the sense of smell. In that sense, yeah. No pun intended, right? (laughs) It was... um, Well, a bumper pool, right? What does a bumper pool smell like? (laughs) It smells like rubber and felt. And uh, when it's brand new, the faint scent of adhesive. Uh, (laughs) The faint scent of adhesive. (laughs) Dude, you're rolling already, man. I like it. So then you combine that with the smell of vinyl and the smell of just the actual needle on the vinyl. And then the places that you went to at that point to purchase the vinyl were generally not like what we have now, big box retail, right? Except you don't really purchase vinyl in big box retail anymore. You go back to the places where we bought it. And where did you say that was? Did you say 
I Iowa? was in Southern Illinois. In, oh, Southern uh, Illinois. Yeah, a town called Centralia. So, like, you wow. basically had... You and Superman, right? Or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Superman and, uh, yeah, lots of other power pop junkies. You know, we knew of this distant land, Chicago and Champaign, Illinois, where, and Rockford, Illinois, where where stuff was happening. And we were in Southern Illinois, so we were around, you know, where Head East and REO Speedwagon was happening. And there were all these characters in these little towns. Like, you know, you mentioned Superman, so that's Metropolis. Right. But uh, you had this town, Marissa, Illinois, where called uh, Yield Music Shop. And that's where people went for like great amps and great guitars. And you had Heil in that actual town. Really? Uh, yeah. And they actually made like dump trucks, but they also made talk boxes. That's not the same Heil that makes the microphones now, is it? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, I'm sure it's some offshoot of the brand, but that was it. So the whole like Heil talk box and yeah. all that, they made like serious like labor hardware, you know, That's the, amazing, the metal. Because I knew about the talk box and then I would see the dump trucks and I was like, hey, it's Heil. And I was like, no, Lid, you stupid. Of course, it's not the same Heil, but it really is. And they had, yeah, they made a lot of the horns and in, in, in PAs at that point, which, you know, are pretty funny to look at compared to what's used now. But you would go into these pockets and there would be those like curators of history. And they always had like a certain attitude or skepticism about you know, the young people, and then you would like sort of have, like prove your right to exist in their store. <laughs> and uh, that, it was that way with records as well. We had this place called JD's Emporium, and JD was probably the king of, you know, uh, Elvis and Buddy Holly and, and all this stuff. So he was educating and, and he was fully into ACDC and The Clash and The English Beat and all of this stuff. And so he was educating us. And, you know, once you pass the rite of passage, those places smelled like old downtown stores that no one else was interested in that people could get for low rent and make wood crates. And you go in there and thumb through records that were in plastic sleeves. That's cool, man. So it's like uh, I picture like the smell of old wooden floors and maybe like just a hint of like mildewy attic. Mildewy attic, mold. <laughs> Um, yeah, all the refuse in the attic from all the stores that came before it, you know, decaying up there. The <laughs> all right. So now what about your, um, did you play in bands first after that? You know, did you start picking up an instrument? I did. I did. We had a, uh, music store in our town called Loomis Music and they did all the band instruments, but the really cool deal was, um, they had this guy named Keith Woods and Keith Woods and his brother, Steve Woods had a band called Slider, right? And that's because of the second T-Rex album. Not Tyrannosaurus Rex, but when they went electric. Not because of White Castles? Yeah, not because of those. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Slider played everything amazing. And uh, and they were great. And Keith gave guitar lessons. So all us little fledgling rockers could go to the guy who is, he could play in St. Louis, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah. One thing that is cool, I think, about the Midwest, too, is Midwest was a real powerhouse, you know, that you may not have known about for music. You've got, like, Heil in middle Illinois. you got St. Louis music going on, producing, yep. like, Ampeg amps and stuff, weren't they? Yeah. And Kalamazoo, Mi Michigan, where Gibson, Gibson amps and all that stuff. St. Louis started, music right? also made electric guitars, which they were pushing technology. They had these packs that you could literally put in the guitar and you had toggle switches for your effects so you didn't have pedals. And they're actually really incredible. That sounds kind of like the Rockman. Mm-hmm. It predates Rockman. And also the, there was an amp called the Seymour Duncan Convertible. And Seymour Duncan adopted that St. Louis music idea in that amp where you could actually put the electronics of a pedal in a socket like a push socket, and then you would have whatever ones you chose on your amp, actual tube amp in the circuitry. Oh, cool. So you're controlling it from the guitar, but the mm -hmm. amp, the stuff's happening down in the, in the amp itself. That was the Seymour Duncan model. The St. Louis Music, everything was controlled from the guitar. That's pretty hip, man. Yeah, like passive that. pickups, but active effects. All right, so... You were way into listening to music, getting around the music stores. Mm -hmm. I still haven't heard you tell me that you picked up a guitar, man. Was there, was there, were you playing music in a band at some point before you got into the recording part? Well, as you well know, it's hard to even like talk about gu guitar um, living in Nashville because <laughs> you kind of go, I don't want 
anyone to think by any means I think I was ever a guitar player. Yeah, your next session to be, yeah. Joe, I heard you play guitar on that podcast, yeah. man. Why don't you uh, do this next overdub for us? <laughs> the one thing that uh, I picked up a guitar and it was an acoustic guitar and I started taking lessons from the Mel Bay songbook and uh, all that was, uh, you know, boring as hell playing Tom Dooley and Swing Low Sweet Chariot <laughs> and uh, all that at the junior college in a class in at 12, 13. But at that, about that same time, I was mowing grass. So uh, part of like mowing grass allowed me to say to my parents, I want to pay for lessons. And they were always very much into like, if I did it and I committed my own finances to it, you know, I didn't know this at that time, but that's where they were at. If I did it and I committed my own finances and I displayed a habitual behavior in that sense with an interest, they would support it. So I got to get to Keith and then I had this horrible KSG that looked like Angus Young, but the strings were about an inch off of the fretboard at the 12th fret and it made a better microphone than a guitar. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I just mowed grass and uh, and my dad there was a Gibson 335 and a Fender Twin in that music store, in the Loomis Music Store where Keith taught. And so he uh, took me down and I co-signed a loan. And I think my payments were like 20 bucks a month. And so I got a 335 cool. and a Fender Twin. And uh, they had this thing on Twins called the Ice Cube back then. And you could remove the spring reverb and couple the verb back into the circuitry so you'd have a drive Wow. So you could just get more more drive out of your amp and just skip the reverb yeah. entirely. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, I definitely appreciate, you know, your sense of follow through and ambition. And like, you know, if you demonstrate, how did you put it, uh, the, the ability to be habitual with it, then you're going to do it. I mean, dude, you've been doing this for a long time. I mean, you're not <laughs> yeah. an old guy. You're, you're a young guy, you know? <laughs> no, I'm an old guy. But you look just, like a young yeah, guy. I you pickled know, but... myself from 25 to 35, so. Yeah. What did you do? You pickled yourself? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not not the best advice. Well, you know, the, you know, if you stay out of the sun, you get a studio tan. Well, right? that's true, right? right? So, um, well, that's cool, man. And, and um, I think that that is a good key takeaway for our listeners, who I like to refer to as the rock stars, for all of us is, you know, staying in this and, and not quitting, not giving up, just just keep doing it, keep chipping away. I mean, I know for myself personally, even with this podcast, I constantly am, you know, running into doubts and sure. wondering if I'm doing it right. And so it's nice to be reminded to just keep, you know, just keep the path as you go. Yeah, it's the truth. You know, you either create or you criticize. And as a, you know, a creator, I don't know if anyone can criticize you more than yourself. And so, like, getting with that whole dynamic is a long road. <laughs> that sounds like, I was going to ask you for an inspirational quote. That sounds like it, right? You either create or you criticize. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and your worst critic is yourself. Yeah. Probably one I go back to a lot is, you know, is just for my dad and my grandfather was always just, uh, you know, it's really easy to criticize yourself when you're trying to create something and make something happen. You could sell, just as you were saying, you can start selling yourself out of wanting to do something without really seeing it all the way through. And so possibly creating situations where later on you regret that you abandoned at that point and you want to go back to it, which is also part of creativity. Yeah. But, you know, bloom where you're planted. Right? What is it? Bloom where you're planted? Yeah. Nice. So, man. I yeah, like that's that. a good one. So it's like, you know, you got, you are who you are. Yeah. Just like open up and just do your thing. Yeah. Uh, I made it more hippie. No, I guess you were probably more hippie with yours, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it is that. And I'm happy with hippie. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll go there. But yeah, we were just talking about, you know, before we started, you know, friends we know. And, uh, and you could start out being creative. And part of creating art for commerce creates the environment for criticism, which can become very demotivating and then you can get to the point where you question the essence of why you create your art. But maybe your creativity isn't the issue. Maybe your medium, your outlet is the issue. And we were discussing a friend who was crazy creative, genius creative person. And he found a medium where all of his skill set is an asset. Right. Instead of being, instead of a being in a fully art for commerce where people were continually probably reminding him 
it's too complicated, it's too all over the place. Right, right. Uh, you know, so he found his medium. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And you wouldn't even know unless you just, you know, open up and bloom, right? You got to right. put yourself out there to yeah. start making mistakes and find out where your best fit is and where you belong, right? Yeah, as you say, like spending time with stuff and that whole concept, I'm getting on the other side of the hill of understanding it as well. Part of where you're planted is not trying to bring all of your desire and all of your idea into that piece of earth, right? So right. it's like what is needed from me in this specific instance may be me shutting down my creative mind and and really serving the goal of that moment. Yeah, so, or say opening up just this portion of my creativity and, and exactly allowing that. to help yeah. in the situation, but not trying to force, you know, square pegs into round holes with all my other ideas too. Probably early in my career, I had a lot of trouble with wanting to air out frustrations and creativity in everything I did. Yeah. Right? So it, was, uh, it led to like good friends going, are you ever not aggressive? <laughs> Are you ever not an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you ever not like just pushing to the edge, you know, in yeah. level and yeah. idea and all of that. So, you know, there really is like that yin and yang of it that I'm grateful that I made it through that period and am kind of on that side of it. So as you said, before we started, my number one goal is, enjoy and right. yeah, have fun. contribute. Yeah. I think uh, when I had Matt Rossbang on the podcast, he also shared that as sort of like, you know, when you're making records, like we're here to have fun, enjoy it, you know? Yeah. But so there is another, you know, let me throw this back at you, devil's advocate too. I mean, you know, you have done astonishing accomplishments with your music, you know, multiple Grammys, number one record of the year. We didn't win the guys well, with win, the motorcycle helmets from France. Enough, won. Fair yeah. enough. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, like, there is an element of push through and like persistence, and maybe some of that kind of intensity that you brought that you had to dial back on. Maybe that helps you get to this point too. Oh, how, yeah. how do you comment about that balance? I mean, should we all just be chill and mellow and just kind of no, hope for good things not. to happen to us? Absolutely not. You know, two other people that I've been fortunate enough to one to work with and one to uh, actually I worked with both of them but in different manners. One is an artist, and he says, he always says, to answer your question with a thing I've heard from this artist that totally applies to it, we're about the same age, and that he's like, when you get into these sort of things, I want to have a T-shirt that says because of or in spite of. Right. And on the back, maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like your your problems might also be your strengths. Right. But you like managing how to key them at the right moments is probably, that was cool. My watch made a key sound. Nice. Yeah, um, good timing. Yeah, good. Nice. Foley. Right moment. Uh, <laughs> well, so um, one of the things I like to ask for is, um, you know, you've done all these accomplishments. For some of us listening, we might be thinking, that's pretty awesome, man. He's he's pretty awesome, but you know, I'm just me. I'm just trying to learn this stuff, so yeah, uh, I don't see the connection. Like, I'll never get there. Or something. Can you humanize it a little bit and share with us a great story about like maybe one of your worst recording session disasters, or you know, what was the biggest object you ever hurled across the control room, or something <laughs> like that? Oh man, we don't want to. There's a lot of those. Um, all the accomplishments in that, I never, I don't view them that way, but because it is art for commerce, it's only in its time and there's a new generation every time. And if you're fortunate enough to be a part of something that impacts culture in a, in a manner, maybe it lasts through a couple of generations. And I don't have a problem with that. So I'm always starting, you know, every day. So I understand that I've gotten to a place where I get less frustrated about the external components and less plugged into that, more plugged into what is the essence emotionally of what we're trying to accomplish and, and to have a listener feel and react to. Not specific, but just get them in the same place of what the entertainment is intended to elicit from a listener. So earlier, I had a lot of trouble with that. So it is that early, like middle school, teenage thing where you start hitting things, you know, punch a wall or 
get that type of frustration. And it ended with me getting a boxer fracture on my right hand because I hit a stone table until it broke. (laughs) Before that... Wait, was this in the studio? Mm, this was out of the studio after being in the studio, but it wow. was it was just the combination of how you can work yourself up and yeah. how I hadn't developed the discipline to um, short circuit that. And that was the absolute most ridiculous thing I've ever done. So, and driving in to explain to the doctor in the emergency room at 11 o'clock at night was very uh, humbling. Well, luckily you got out of the studio at a reasonable hour then. You still had time for that. Yeah, reasonable hours are a great idea. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so, you know, you bring up some interesting points too. Like you've been making records for decades. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, but it's true, right? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'm happy. (laughs) You've been making records for decades. And, you know, yet the music and the cultural and the tastes, particularly in your case, because you're making a lot of commercial music, mm-hmm. as you put, uh, or how did you put it? Music for, for commerce, commerce. Art for commerce, right? right? So that commerce and the styles and the genres of music change around you. Mm-hmm. And you can't necessarily keep making the same record over and over once you learn how to make it. So you got to keep being flexible. You got to keep relearning um, you you are able to hold on to a lot of the tool sets probably and the skill sets as you acquire them, but the approach to what you're making for art artistically and what kind of art you're making probably keeps shifting, right? Yeah, it does. I would say that teaching people to record was probably ever bit, if even doubly more so important to me and the effect it has on me and what I learned from doing that. Not only from their perspective, but, you know, I I liken the analogy to being like a player. And, you know, when you're in the studio, the players you're playing with are people that are expected to be there and have a great idea every day, every time. And that's what you're doing as an engineer. So I liken the analogy to, for me, it's like I go, I've done this for decades Now I've gone back and I'm literally taking theory again if I were a player. And then I'm looking at, well, why is it that I always gravitate towards this? And now I get a little bit of like technology and science behind that, which has informed me. And then my natural reaction to understanding is then how can I exploit what I do? Because now I understand why I like that. How can I exploit it in a different manner? And that helps with what your question was, you know, how can I adapt to different styles? As an engineer, I've really become happy at this stage in my career with tracking. I love tracking because you're part of establishing what the outcome is going to be. And it's the most creative part as an engineer. So um, you're all trying to pick up whatever this thing is and you don't know how heavy it is till you start trying to pick it up and everybody's working together. And, if, and, and when you're motivated and you're excited and everybody's having a win, then you're concerned with everyone in the room. Are they able to hear? Are they able to do what it is they're required to do well? And that becomes your priority. It's amazing what you what you can lift off the floor. Yeah, that's a good point. You're yeah. trying to empower everybody in the group right. to do this thing together. Yeah, you're you know, kind of the bartender, so you make a, <laughs> <laughs> you're the bartender. Right? You make another point too, which is that um, you know, there is a, a great deal that can be accomplished by a group of people when yeah. everybody's invested, and it's that it's wonderful when you have a sense that everybody's in it all the way. You yeah, know? you work with a group of people like that. Yeah. So you know, you you kind of shared with us. Um, well, you didn't exactly give us a worse recording session disaster, and you didn't describe it. Well, no, you you, you, oh, punched, the, you punched the crap well, out of that table. That, so that was you good. asked the largest object. That was a pretty big object, a stone <laughs> table. Yeah, but my hand was small. Uh, one time, a long time ago, about around probably the time we, uh, we actually first met, uh, I was in a session on that flick record, and um, Joe Costa, another great engineer, was assisting, and he also had this incredible Juno, Roland Juno synthesizer. And I'd forgotten that it was on the other side of the console, and this is in the days of large control rooms. Rockstars, those Roland Juno sound like this. 
bow, bow. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> and so it was uh, on the other side of the console, the speakers, and I'd gotten to a, a point of maximum frustration. And I picked up the studio chair and I threw it over the console and the speakers and it dropped in between the console and the large monitors that were in the wall. And after I threw it, I thought, man, I've got to clear all this stuff because I don't want to buy it. And after I'd cleared all that stuff, I was extremely happy for an instance till it crashed into something and I saw white plastic keyboard keys fly up in the air. Oh, no. Yeah. So that oh, was that no. one. Joe. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. Well, I fix it. I, you know, you have to find one or fix it uh, when you do stuff like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, you know, you make a good point, though, because I totally understand that frustration, the creative drive that makes you want to do this stuff in the first place, that makes you want to work your ass off in the studio. You know, I like to talk about the stories of like, you know, somebody goes in, rock stars, you go into the studio, you spend eight hours, 12 hours all weekend, you forget to eat food, you your best friends that you're in a band with become your worst enemies in a right. moment, you know, of, of overdub. As you try and figure something out, you start saying things to people that you're normally polite to. And all of a sudden you're not saying very polite things Correct. to them. Yeah. And you know, your, your girlfriend or your wife is, a, is um, threatening for the third time to uh, take the kids because you haven't left the studio yet. Right. And, um, but it's that creative drive that urge to want to make a great work of art, you know, a great record to get something to sound really as much as powerful as the stuff you love that drives you to do that. And, you know, Joe, as you're saying, it's like learning and understanding yourself and figuring out how to redirect all that energy towards the proper stuff really opens up pretty incredible possibilities. You know, I, I met you first. Um, you were already doing great, great work. And you're working with a lot of bands that I loved. But now reconnecting with you all this time later and seeing, you know, these all the Grammy Awards and the number ones and stuff like that, I, you weren't having that same level of success when I first met you. But you did later, you know, and it probably, as you say, has a lot to do with that really understanding how to direct all that powerful creative energy. Yeah, and that's all nice for you to say. That That is exactly the key. I think there's a lot of myths that you can buy into when you're in that process. And that's the stuff that creates the problem is that you've bought into a myth. There is no yeah. pound of flesh at the door rule. Right, right. Um, and it doesn't have to be done until it's right. And you don't have to show up at... 10 o'clock and wait to actually do something meaningful four or five hours later, you know, that goes back to w what you've learned from other people. You know, if you surround yourself with, you're the team, you're intentional about the team. Everyone who is there is on the team and we're starting and we're going to be great. Whatever it is, we're going to handle our part and we're going to do it and we're going to run. And in the middle, we're going to eat something and then we're going to run again, and then we're going to close it down, and we're going to go see people that we really care about outside of that room. And then we're going to look at what we did, Yeah, and, and it's all going to be okay. And if we do our day that way, we'll probably feel great afterwards and want to come back and do it again tomorrow. Exactly. Instead of doing that thing where you chase your tail or you just run yourself till you drop and you, you create all these, these um, external scenarios from that fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so that's all great, great advice and encouragement. Share with us also a story of sort of a big break moment for you. You know, there must have been some stuff along the way where you felt like it either, you know, you had a break or a sort of aha moment figuring stuff out or you had your hit moment. Yeah. My aha moment. I don't know. Maybe I'm still going to have that. <laughs> Maybe it was when you were in the emergency room and your <laughs> yeah. hand hurt a lot. Yeah, that like, was a good aha, aha. moment. Yeah, that's a good aha moment. Harder to push faders with a come on <laughs> in the cast. That was a good aha moment. I would say that... When, when I, I meant no pun when I said big break. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good pun, actually. That was a good good dadism there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I would say when I came to Nashville, I came to go to Belmont College at that point. And at that point in music in Nashville, country was a thing that was basically for 12 states. Right. Uh, right in the middle of America. And there were a lot of people here that were trying to do something different. 
there were a lot of people in Athens and Atlanta and other little pockets. And there were people all the way up in Champaign, Chicago, and Minneapolis trying to do something different. And they started running up and down. Let's not forget Seattle, right? I mean, well, that's they later on. They went to a country though, right? Oh, that's yeah. later on still. That's okay, later on country. still. So we were trying to do stuff and we were just figuring it out. And at that point, what I found hilarious was you would go outside of Nashville. And as far as Nashville is a brand, anything other than music for those 12 states, you were immediately slighted. And there seemed to be the reasoning because of what the Art for Commerce was at that point totally negated the fact that everything they were into on both coast actually occurred down the street from where we were. <laughs> right. So it was a bit absurd. So it was neat how it grew through all of that. And then it started attracting other people who kind of got what was going on behind the scene of Nashville. So my point to answering your question was a big moment for me was when there's Richard Dodd moving to town. Pete yeah. Coleman is here. Those two guys were young dudes from Luton outside of London. They drove into London and became assistant engineers at the same time. They made the records I bought in those mildew, drafty record stores, yeah. and they were here. So I could talk to, I took Ballroom Blitz to fourth grade show and tell, <laughs> and now I could talk to the guy who recorded and mixed that. I bought Kung Fu Fighting. I could talk to the guy who recorded and mixed that. So That's so cool, man. That was a big deal. And that type of influence, them and others coming here and being creative with the young people that were trying to do something different. Eventually, we thought it would be 10 years, 5 years, 10 years, 15 years. It was 20 years later that you had basically Kings of Leon and Paramore who had broken outside of the United States, actually established success in the United States, and then changed the brand here. The brand is already different in Europe and, and England. So that was... Yeah. That was... Well, on Jack White, Third Man Records here. I mean, Nashville is... Um, well, he came there because of those reasons, of, right. of those other people and the studio infrastructure and all of those people who really liked the art part of Art for Commerce were actually coming here. And then you can hear it and even in that, in the genre that I'm primarily working in now, country music is a place where you can still have guitars. Art for commerce, American pop music, not a lot of guitars. It's replaced by keyboards and synth synthesizers and, like that, yeah. and that occupying that distortion because it translates better in the level of distortion that people are putting in their mixes mm -hmm. for small device playback. Yeah, it's true. It's all about, you know, what the final experience is yeah. dictates what ends up happening on the front end of it, for sure. Rockstars, I would encourage you guys to do this, too, because you're listening to this all over the globe. Nice. While we have the ability to tell you our feelings about what we think Nashville is to the rest of the world, if you feel like you want to let us know what you think Nashville is, just email me at lidge at recordingstudiorockstars.com and tell me what, what kind of music you think is coming from Nashville. I'd love to hear that from you. And I'll, I'll even forward it to Joe if you, you send some cool ideas. That'd be great. All right. So Joe, let's jump into some geek out stuff here for a minute. Here's a question. What was one of the craziest ways that you ever recorded? What was like a kind of a wild, unusual thing you did in the studio? What I did was uh, I really wanted to amplify the band before I amplified them through a console. So I brought in an actual stage in a tracking room that was large enough that you could put in uh, basically a three-foot high stage. And we set the drummer on that stage and brought in a, a PA. And then I split the mics as well as doing a lot of different techniques within the room. And I placed the band in the actual large room with all of their individual amplification in isolated rooms. So when the drummer played, it was hitting everybody physically just from the sound pressure level in the room mm -hmm. and, and that PA. And it, it translated into their performance. It translated into the sound of the room, like just maximizing everything that was going on. What you do in a large space like that with the amplified source in the room, it starts to compress more before you use any equipment. 
Yeah. Um, and so it was crazy. I had varied outcomes. Some songs I ended up having to not use any of the room, but it's still the close mic and, and the way everyone felt while the tracking was going on actually impacted the recording. Um, is that the Katie's? That was uh, Flick. Oh, Flick. Nice. Yeah. And I did different things with, with the Katie's, but similar sorts of things in that where we'd run um, Jason through three different amplifiers and all of those were in the actual room and the room was large enough that I could still do the drums, but you were getting the same sort of effect. Instead of pushing it off into a room, we were talking about let it bleed. Yeah, yeah that type of leakage um, was not problematic. Well, so some thoughts about that. The three amp guitar thing, one thing that's cool about approaching it like that, if you do it the right way, there's plenty of wrong ways to do yeah. that stuff. I've done them all. <laughs> yes, same here. But you do the right way and, and you can take that single guitar part. So we're talking about a band that's a trio. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, you know, you might've been thinking, how do I make this record sound big and powerful as a trio and not make it sound like there's, you know, not just try and do it through multiple layering of guitars right. where it loses the thing that they do live on stage. So when you make the really big guitar amp sound, three amps or whatever, sometimes you can just get more of a wall of guitar mm -hmm. from a single part, right? Is, would you say that's helpful? It is helpful. The key to that, going back to the thing of motivating everybody in the room and encouraging everybody in the room and, and getting encouragement back creates the type of environment where you can do things beyond yourself as a group. So making each person sound important, that's what we're talking about. Right. And then you begin to negate the need for 100 tracks. Now I might have 60 tracks because I'm splitting it into so many different types of microphones and it's so easy to mute those. Um, the problem that happens a lot in recorded music and production is it's all there and none of it's muted. Right. You didn't make any editorial decisions. Yeah. Can you imagine the New York Times without an editor? Right. That's what we have. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a loaded comment, but maybe it's true. I don't know. Um, well, so the other takeaway I wanted to do was about the drums. And, and you yeah. basically just said it, which is like, you know, make each person feel particularly special and valuable yeah. to the results of the music. You know, treat their instrument like it's a big deal. It doesn't mean make a, a thing that's meant to be quiet too loud, but it means, you know, make each thing powerful so that there's a lot to contribute to the final thing, especially when there, you've got like a three piece yeah. and, you know, each instrument does have to contribute a lot. But you talked about the PA with the drum set. Now it's just the drums that are going through the PA in this case, right? Yep. So it's not vocals, it's not guitars, but what it does is it creates a sound that maybe in this case for a band that writes and rehearses in a rehearsal space turned up really freaking loud. And, you know, their music is meant to be gigantic. If you take it and go into the studio, it's like, okay, we're going to put you with some cereal boxes now and you got to hit those. And don't worry, they'll be gigantic in the mix. Right. You know, how is the drummer expected to play how the they're right gonna thing? How going to make that leap, yeah. right? So it's a great lesson to say, I like to call it building the machine in the studio. Right. You know, when you set up for tracking, you get everybody right. Mm -hmm. You're kind of building this machine that once it's all dialed in, now you can capture that moment when people perform just right. right. And it's like you have to build the machine for the drums. So that's pretty cool, man. I don't know. Do you have any other examples of funky, weird things that you had to create like that to get the instrument to be right at tracking? Oh, yeah. I love, uh, and I still do this a lot. I'll hook up pedals or different tape machines in that and and use uh, sends and then I'll return it back into the musician or the singer's um, uh, fader as they're performing and I'll perform spins or different ambiences or slapbacks and we set it up to where I'm capturing those performances so they can be put together with the final performance. So the musician is hearing what you're doing while they're performing and you're also capturing it to use in the mix later. Right. What's a spin? A spin means like um, if someone hit a note, I would increase the feedback on a delay so mm -hmm. that it feeds back into itself and then it blooms into a whole bunch of other delays. Yeah. So a spin gives you a tail right, of, okay, okay. Uh, of delays. Um, rock you wouldn't stars. physically get up out of your chair and spin in no, the room. No, no. Like I think I probably picked that up from Richard and Pete Coleman. Uh, yeah, spin echo. 
Because then you'd um, have to have a Wi-Fi guitar pedal on your else you get all tangled, you know? <laughs> that would be bad. Yeah, and then when you get the echo like feeding back into itself, you can then change the time and raise the pitch or lower the pitch. And you basically become like a DJ <laughs> I love uh, that on that stuff. actual Im- That's instrument. That's actually what motivates me when I go to the Bonnaroo Hay Bale Studio because I've got the band listening to the stereo two-track mix yeah. They're hearing it. I'm mixing them. It's a feedback loop. Exactly. Whatever they do affects me, and what I do affects them. So they act, you know, that was what we're talking about, is you have a performer, and they're creating an action, and then you're reacting to their action and giving them something back that informs them and influences them in their next action. All right, so a lot that of our listeners cool. are going to be typically in, um, you know, probably laptop, mm-hmm. working in a DAW, Pro Tools, yeah. Presona Studio One, Logic, you know, any mm-hmm. anything, choose one. What are some ways that you have seen people successfully do that in a much simpler setup, you know, without a big console and without everything being guitar pedals necessarily? Oh, definitely. So what I was talking about with guitar pedals and with sounds, what, what we've been talking about is the laptop and whatever your DAW software is. From where we started recording, I like to tell people, uh, engineers, they need to start thinking of themselves as when they're tracking, they're capturing data, right? So you want to create independent lines of treated data that you can manipulate later when everyone's gone. So you have those resources. Now, this leads to the answer to your question. Everyone loads everything up with plugins. You want to minimize your use of plugins and you want to start as an engineer, you want to like actually engineer. I liken it to when I first started wanting to mix, there was a very successful mix engineer and I was a kid and I was delivering tracks on the project and he was mixing. It was at a place closer to where we are right now that was called 16th Avenue Sound. Okay, cool. He was mixing in there and he was having a good time and he took a break and took an interest in talking to somebody probably because he'd been in a room by himself for quite some time. And I said, you know, you're an incredible mixer. Give me the one minute mixing thing. And this is when you're fully on a desk and you have multiple machines that are doing each different component. And I said, what could I do as a mixer wanting to mix? Give me the one minute treatment. And he said, load up the tape bring up all the faders at a low level all in the middle and hit play. And every time you hear something you don't like, find it and mute it. (laughs) And then when you're at the end of the song, just don't even think about it. Go with your gut. When you get at the end of the song, rewind and hit play. If you have something left, mix that. If you don't, call the person and tell them that you're not the person. Oh, man. Wow. That was a good minute. That is a good minute. That's a lot of bold takeaways too. So the first takeaway I get from that is I think the number one tool that we always have, the most powerful one is level. But Mm -hmm. mute is actually it. Mute is the first tool. Yeah. And then the fader level is the next one. Level. Like you can make more effect to the music by just making things louder or softer in the mix. And mute is a key to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Because as you minus something, then it gives the space to something else to occupy it and be heard. And then the very last one is the boldest and hardest takeaway of all, which says, you know, I think what's implicit in it is if you really want to move forward Mm -hmm. in advance, you have to work with great people. You know, you got to find people making great music to work with. And if there's something left to mix when you press play on it, then that's an implication that there are great people making that music and sending it to you. But maybe it's your own music too. Yeah, I mean, it applies to all that. That is the essence of a great motivation to grow and to move forward is to always, if you're waking up and you're going and doing the same thing and you're comfortable, you're probably not in a great spot of growth. Um, So (laughs) Good, I must be kicking ass right now because I'm stressed (laughs) out like crazy. (laughs) Exactly. And you want to put yourself in situations to where you have fear. You know that you're going to go there. And I I love getting in situations where I'm going to be a part of something. I can't believe that I'm getting to be on the team that day. And like a boxer, you got to control that fear 
to where it's not crippling, everything that happens is going to be random. You're going to have to react to it. There's going to be unseen issues, but you've got to be in those environments where you're challenged and it's okay to wipe out and roll to the curb. You know, after that, you got to get up and then run with the big dogs again. And eventually, yeah, you're falling down and going to the curb will minimize and you'll have a lot better concept of what choices to make to keep that flowing. Maybe on a previous fall, you punched the hell out of that curb and just I, I, and broke it away and it's I, not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or it broke your hand. <laughs> Um, so this, this leads me to a question that, that I don't even know how you answer it, but I feel like asking it, man, how do you make a number one record? You don't think about the fact that you're making a number one record, you know, that's the job of the commerce part of art for commerce. Um, I like the idea of uh, artistry. I think a great mentality for a creator is that all of my choices are important choices and everyone who's a part of these choices are important. And what you do with that, that's your job. You know, so if you're satisfying that, this is the right song. These are the right people to make it. We've made a version that we can build on and complete. And I can finish them all out to the best of my ability. Then that's for someone else to decide. Yeah. When you get into the idea of, I think this is the single and that you're creating those curbs. Mm-hmm. To get kicked to. <laughs> You're making a curb. <laughs> You're making to end a curb. Up on. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, oh, so many good uh, metaphors here. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I know that one of the classic challenges for me and for most of our listeners, um, man, it just happened to me the other day. I thought I had a killer thing happening in the studio. I knew, I mean, I know I did a good job in this production. And then I went to go do my mix and it wasn't a long mix. It was pretty quick, you know? But I was like, you know, I was like, man, this is kicking. This is slamming. And I take it and I listen to it outside of the studio. And once again, the low end sounds like crap. And I was just, God. So what can you tell us? Do you have a one-minute trick for getting the low end just right in your mix so that your bass and your kick drum is not destroying your mix somehow? Yeah, I would go back to uh, that mixer after you told me that that one-minute version. That was very impactful to me. That guy was uh, Humberto Gatica, and I respect his work, but I probably wouldn't mix that way or mix on those type of artists. But man, incredible. But his sonic integrity, his depth, his width, the fidelity of it, right? So I started thinking on that, and how does this apply to me when you're doing things like that? To go to your question, I think once you get to that point, like what's left to mix, that's where the play comes in of level, and you're going to move to establishing a level. And I tend to approach that level as less than what my gut wants to do because I'm going to create scenarios that are additive to that actual sound. Without, mm -hmm. I know it's going to happen, but I'm waiting for that to happen. Parallel compression, expansion, EQ, uh, EQ. Um, which you're messing with the phase. I, I want to understand the phase of the actual audio. I want to have levels for it. I want to figure out where I can pan the different components. In the center, I'm going to have kick, snare, bass, and a lead vocal. They all have to work together. Then all the other drums have to bring the image and the width and the depth into the sound. Then all the things that are polyphonic the keyboard, the guitars, the strings, the horns, the background vocals, those are going to have to find incidental pan positions or left, right, center. And I've got to figure out how I'm not masking the part, right? So maybe I have things on top of each other within that stereo, which is a trick as well. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there's a left and a right. We, we just are imagine you, are you the center. Are checking against mono yet at this point or is that later on? I get the first sort of level mix at a lower volume in mono. And then I come out of mono into stereo and I uh, mute all the like polyphonic aspects and I'm at that kick, snare, bass, vocal. And I want to get that working. And then I want, so kick, snare, vocal, bass then working. Then I can look, that kick and that bass is going to live in the center. Are they separated? Are they masking each other? that gets to the next point past level and pans 
filters, not EQs. Right. Right. So then start, how do I minimize aspects of the reproduction of the sound to give it its pocket sonics fidelity in the center that are going to exist there? So the kick, is it above the bass and the bass is below the kick? Is the bass above the kick? Right. Is there programming that exists below yeah. the live kick and getting all that sorted and then bringing back in the polyphonic sounds and the incidental pans and the wide pans? Then looking for, do I have parts on top of each other? What's the most optimum position for these parts? Are they creating masking frequencies in the lows, the low mids? Right. Is there too much reproduction of the high shelf on a lot of these sounds that are now competing with the vocal as right. I've introduced them? Deal with them with filters. Your high pass and low pass filters, your pans and your levels, those are not plugins. Right, exactly. Right. They, they, they plug you in. They plug you in to what's going on, right. So I've got some great takeaways from that. One of them is simple. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Or look for the stuff that's broke before you start fixing things, right? You're actually yeah. listening to see what you got, and then you're looking for these things where they're competing with each other or this is crowding the vocal. Now, how can I fix that one thing against the vocal? Exactly. Instead of, you know, you didn't, you never mentioned soloing in there. Right. I noticed that, you know, yeah. you're not talking about soloing instruments and trying to create no. something on its own because it, it never is on its own. No one's going to hear it that way. Yeah. They're all uh, going to hear it together and, you know, assume that it's not broken. Assume that part of your job is to go through and it's going to go through a lot of things before it gets to the person who's listening to it. So how can I fix how this was captured in order for it to live within this performance? Right. And then once you get to that point, then how can I make it more impactful? And that's where you get into your parallel compressions, where you get into um, temporal type of effects to where you're adding like short reflections and maybe a little bit of modulation in them and then a little bit of feedback or spin to that modulation, which is very, very short, mm -hmm. like 128th or more, 256th of wherever the tempo's at. Yeah. I mean, math and music, they, they go together. They go together. <laughs> <laughs> they go together. From, from childhood all the way through to finishing a mix. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're at 120 beats per minute, then your quarter note's 500 milliseconds, right? If this is a eighth note based rhythm, then you're going to have to note that everything should be around 250 mm -hmm. and you shouldn't be longer than that very often. And in many cases, you have to go way down on that 125, 62, 31, Do you 15. find that applying with reverbs as well often? Completely with reverbs. You don't want to set them all up just as they are. Filters, length, very, very short pre-delays. There's a big difference between three milliseconds and seven milliseconds. People just jump in and hit 50 or 20. Right. I mean, you micro right. down, the tempo goes all the way down. It goes past milliseconds into microseconds, and it's relative to that. If you look at compression, almost all attacks happen less than one millisecond. Their slowest point in the actual unit is less than one millisecond. Mm-hmm. And so that tempo relates to that. If you want to get into the transient and then you want it to come out of compression before the transient happens again, you have to know that they're playing a 16 based rhythm and what's going on with tempo with my attacks on my compression. Yeah. And your releases too, right? Exactly. So if you pull up, say we're talking about Pro Tools and you pull up a Pro Tools compressor limiter it defaults to an LA-2A. It is so slow. Right. Nothing is that slow. Nothing modern that we use is as slow as an LA-2A. I'm not knocking LA-2As, but generally the way music is now, you're having to operate at one millisecond. It comes up at 10 milliseconds. Yeah. I, I operate attacks below one millisecond. The 1176 it doesn't even get to one millisecond. Its slowest place is 800 microseconds. So that, yeah, I've noticed like you put an L, you put an LA two A on a snare drum and it just makes the snare drum sound like blip 
Because well, it's, it's letting all the tack through and then grabbing. Correct. Right after, so right? you can look at that because we, you know, we grew up where you couldn't look at it. And then now you can see that when you have this gigantic peak and then it goes down and then you have this long space, you know, and then the next one the attack happens, but it's not as big, but the same thing occurs. Mm-hmm. Your attack in your LA two A is ten milliseconds. It, it misses the whole. It releases the half of the compression in sixty milliseconds, but it takes up to fifteen seconds to release the rest. <laughs> so it's clamping down on on like half of your chorus. Yeah, so or all you, of your chorus. And you've made like with a vocal that's very percussive, or with a snare drum, as you use an example, you've created an audio waveform that is not going to make anyone happy. Right, right. Well, man, that's some awesome, awesome deep stuff. And I really appreciate you digging into that. I know Rockstars are going to be super psyched to hear that. Don't be afraid, Rockstars, if you got to rewind that a number of times and listen back, but it'll be (laughs) great, great insights in there. I wanted to add one last takeaway. You talked about reaching for filters as a next move when things are masking each other. And I just wanted to reiterate that a filter it's yet another form of mute. It's muting yeah. the frequencies below a certain point. So yeah. if instruments are masking each other in these lower frequency ranges, you're essentially just saying, well, I'm not getting rid of the instrument. Let's just mute those frequencies that we didn't need anyway and see what happens. It's the truth. Another thing to think about if you're into the thing where you have a, a frequency that's too dominant in the recording that now that you're in a mix, you don't want that. A thing people forget is they look at this thing and they see it's called a de-esser, right? So they think that's for a vocal when a vocal has sibilance, too many S's. Think about it being as a frequency-dependent compressor limiter yeah. at which you can select the width of frequency and the amount that you want it to dip dependent upon what mode you put that de in. So when someone plays something really hard and it's abrasive, you can make this de auto-ride that frequency by whatever your choice is, yeah. 4 dB, 6 dB, 10 dB. And then your outcome is basically a better sounding recording. Yeah, so you can get it. Another thing I'll do with de is I'll use multiple. I'll, yes, I'll, exactly. I, when I get frustrated, I'm like, I hear the S there, but it still sounds like shit here. You yeah. know, I'll go and I'll just add another one. And the, like the s- up around yeah. 7K is one thing, but shh is totally different. And shh, right. you know, those are like whatever, 3K, 4K and nasty as hell. Nasty. You can have too much leakage of hi-hat on a snare top and you can very easily set that at either the shelf function of the DS or and move that frequency to about 5 or 6K and have it aggressively. Because when we're talking about filters, rock stars, there's, there's Thank degrees. Thank you for calling them out by name. Thank you. There's degrees of filtering. So you look at that number, it comes up in, in Pro Tools, for instance, at minus 12 dB per octave. So each octave from that frequency choice, it's reducing 12 dB. You can get it down to minus 6. So you can set that frequency higher. Or you can be extremely aggressive at a minus 24, or some have 32 dB per octave. And they also become very, very effective audio surgery scalpels. Nice. You know? I like that, man. Well, so we're going to take a break here and come back for the jam session. But before we do, Rockstars, I want to remind you that I'll have show notes to everything we're talking about here with Joe Baldrich at rsrockstars.com. And then you can just use the magnifying glass, search for Joe, and it'll take you right to the blog post. It'll also be on the show notes in your iTunes podcast player. So if you just kind of open that up and see the logo there, touch it and just flips through to the show notes, you can just touch through with your finger to take the link straight to the website. We'll be right back in just a moment for the jam session. Woohoo! Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. 
With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks and you get downloadable multi-tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi-track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum drum kit, bass, and guitar is recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, we're back now. I'm here with my guest, Joe Baldrich, in Studio A at Ocean Way in Nashville, Tennessee. Odd name, right? Odd name, indeed. Um, we should probably, we didn't really talk about that, but um, we should probably get into it. We're going to jump in for the jam session, Joe. Uh-oh. I got a question for you. Yeah. Are you ready to jam? Let's do this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've got no switches on my guitar. Actually, I don't even have a guitar. Uh. Tell us, when you were starting out and recording, what was one of the things that was really holding you back? Oh, man. Proximity to it happening, like where it was happening. Um, you I had, felt like you needed to be near action as, as you asked early on in the interview i played guitar but i got in a band it was a lot of fun a lot of this things you described about when you were talking about being in the studio creating things with a band or with artistry and that i had all those experiences within a band they always wanted to play bob seger nothing wrong with bob seger but they wanted to play bob seger REO speedwagon and journey and i wanted to play the split ends and the clash and the police and so it was in that time so, uh, uh, you know, I had all of that sort of stuff and I knew I didn't want to be in a band. I didn't want to do that dynamic. I had already gone to my aggressive future, punching a hard stone table phase with uh, refusing to play um, um, Hold On Loosely one more time. And the drummer had cracked my uh, arm with a... Uh, with the drumstick. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to get in these kind of arguments because that really hurt. Uh, but I want to make records. I'd looked at all those names and, you know, I think that that was from uh, beyond me because there was no reasoning um, in my environment and, and my family and that of performance or uh, records. But I looked at all those names and then I looked, how do you get there? Because I, I did grow up in the Midwest, and it was a great place to grow up, and it was a great place to leave. Right. Um, so uh, but a lot of people didn't. Well, and at that point, too, you kind of had to. If you wanted to be in a studio, you had to go where a studio was. Right. Um, times have changed a little bit. Yes. Have you seen uh, uh, something new as far as whether people really have to leave where they are to go to a different city in order to participate in music and recording? Or has that changed in, in new ways? It's definitely changed and, and will continue to change the ability to do that. It is possible and it is more possible than it ever was. But the point of coming someplace and being established enough for someone to want to work with you remotely, I think still exists. Mm -hmm. A lot of examples of people who might move to a music hub establish their career and then move, you know, to, you know, Bob Ludwig is up in right. Portland, Maine, you know, right. but not before he had, you know, become a world leader in mastering, for example. It's not to suggest that you have to move here and do that, but I think that a part of your plan, if that's a desire to work with a lot of different people, you've got to find the, the best resources where you are and create the best outcome you can and then you need to go and get a response. You have to do that by playing. You also have to do that by 
going into places where there are like-minded people, maybe uh, a little on a little bit different path in a different lane, and then learn from their experience, from their critique of what you're doing, and keep uh, using that to inform what you're creating in your remote place. And then you can actually identify yourself of having certain skill sets that that would create that network for, yeah. for you. So that, that brings to mind a couple of examples outside of what you described. Um, I've had another guest on the show, Daniel Grimmett, mm-hmm. um, and he teaches a course called Virtual Recording Studio and, and basically teaches, you know, he created a home studio, grew it into a business. He teaches the way that he did that. And in there, he talked about doing a studio, a home studio, you could be anywhere, doing it with your laptop online, but starting out in places that are already like hubs. So like, for example, going to a Craigslist and meeting mm-hmm. people the first time there, going to uh, soundbetter.com was one that he mentioned. So in that idea, it's still like going to a, a hub, right. establishing yourself, and then coming back to your place. For myself with this podcast, you know, I didn't just, uh, if I want to teach people more about recording, I didn't just start making videos and hope that people would find them. I made a podcast and I went to a, a place that's fairly popular called iTunes, mm-hmm. you know, and I've heard put the that. podcast there yeah. and that's a way to gather people together. So I just wanted to add that as encouragement because, you know, we have listeners that aren't going to be able to come to Nashville, right. New York and, and Los Angeles, for example, they might be anywhere in the world. And, uh, and I want people to be encouraged that there are multiple ways to sort of go to a place where everybody is and establish yourself. The internet is a great place for that, and it's going to continue to be. I think there's an audience out there that is hungry for entertainment. There's more access worldwide to things that are entertaining than there ever was before. So in your own way, you have plenty of uh, outlets to work at. What do people react to? You know, YouTube, your own SoundCloud Spotify, different sorts of things combined with just great ideas to attract people there for the first time. Uh, And you can start growing um, what it is you're doing by analyzing what people react to in the music you create. Well, so now, Joe, share with us some of the best advice you received. You already did. You already shared some great mixing advice. Anything (laughs) anything good from Richard? Richard Dodd? Uh, He always seems to be, you know, chock full of great advice. uh, Yeah. Um, are you sure you had the microphone the right way around? <laughs> I've done that. Now. You know, it's funny. Sometimes when I'm working with interns or assistants, I've been in the control room and I'm listening. The drums just don't sound right. What's the you know, deal? And I'll go out there and finally go take a look. And they've got the mic pointed not down as an overhead towards the drums, but up towards the ceiling. Yes. Because <laughs> it's not always obvious, which is the front end of this, you know, Correct. microphone. Yeah. But it um, sure does help to use it. Probably the the greatest advice I've gotten is don't measure where you're at just upon the reaction of other other people. You use that as information. Um, don't base where you're at upon how you determine that as a success or failure, and and probably try and think on higher levels than that. Like you truly know from your gut. What's my gut instinct? Am I keyed into? going against that and what happens when that happens things. Basically, the simple version of that is is not to be discouraged by any one event in anything. It's not the end. It's a long road. There's a uh, lot of stuff out there to discourage you too. Exactly, because of that whole deal of uh, a lot of people are not creative. The form that you're in invites criticism it really doesn't matter to me as a creator if people hate what I do or love what I do. It's the same result. It's the intensity of which they love or hate that's important to me. So if they hate it enough to talk about it, then I've accomplished my goal. They've reacted. They've engaged enough to have a reaction and to communicate that reaction to other people. Yeah, it's sort of like if you don't have people that feel strongly that what you've done is terrible, you may be not trying hard enough. Yeah. So it, it, it I don't, accomplishes I don't know who the same this goal. podcast is terrible though. I mean, nobody, no nobody, one does. Right? No, no, not, not at all. Everything's great. <laughs> 
All right, so here's another one. How about a great recording tip hack or secret sauce, something that our rock stars can use today, this very week, this weekend in the studio? I'll give you two. As far as um, on the recording side, lots of people use um, a snare bottom. Lots of people mic the back of an open guitar cabinet. I always say to people who do that, Roadies are the only people that stand behind guitar cabinets. <laughs> That's not necessarily a sound I want to reproduce. And if you lay underneath a snare drum while someone hits it, again, that's not a sound I want to reproduce. So a greater thing uh, that covers everything is walk out while people are playing. And uh, you, in a professional situation, you'd be amazed that, that they're not hitting as loud as they would on a stage. And that's something that a band has to learn. But the ability to walk around and hear where different places are are the best way to find where to place the microphone. So for snare bottom, um, I always label it snare bottom, but it's not. I, I use a pencil condenser um, in cardioid, or I love it when I can find a pencil condenser that's omni, like a Shure KSM-141, which isn't a horribly expensive mic. It is expensive, but... It, it has a lot of flexibility. Um, and I will angle it to where it is pointing directly where the kick beater hits the kick head. And so it's going across the snare bottom. So when you bring that track into your music, you're effectively adding high-end energy to your kick and your snare. Yeah. It's also an excellent candidate to um, heavily color with compression. Mm -hmm. Um it sounds to me like it's somewhat hidden from the cymbals by being down below the snare. So as you compress the crap out of it, it's bringing up more of the drums before it's bringing up all those cymbals from above, right? Definitely. And um, as far as like a capsule position, the capsule of that condenser mic would live right in front of the post of the hi-hat stand. And the drummer's leg is never there. You're not going to get their leg kicking that capsule. And right. it accomplishes that with the snare back. Because usually I'm, if you're going to have a drummer or somebody kick a microphone capsule, it's better to have them kick somebody else's microphone capsule, right? <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's my microphone. Um, the mic in the back of a cabinet, uh, I understand that, the comp that people are trying to accomplish probably more bottom within their tone. Dynamic microphones have presence peaks. So they, they have a higher representation of um, high mid frequencies. So dynamic is a great thing to use on axis at the cone of a guitar speaker. It's going to get all of the presence peaks and the articulation of the chord or the part. Then using a ribbon microphone or a um, large diaphragm condenser that can obtain a figure eight on the outside of the cone. So where the speak, the paper meets the actual physical um, flexible part of the speaker, that's where the bottom is. And uh, that's a much better place than, than miking the back of a cabinet. Now why a figure eight? Is that, does that give you a better response? It does. You're basically closing down the sides by about 20 dB and it's in a weird way, it's sort of like a modified mid side angle, but you're not going to use it in that way. The dynamic and the figure eight will be at about a 45 degree angle. So the figure eight's at about a 45 degree angle instead of a 90 degree angle in a mid side. Oh, cool, cool. It's at a 45 degree angle to the dynamic cardioid microphone. And the combination of that sound sounds more like the actual guitar speaker cabinet than any other thing I've found. Very cool. So just to clarify that, the dynamic mic is pointed sort of straight on at the speaker. At the cone. At the cone. And it maybe is in a little bit, a little somewhere between the edge and the center? It's, uh, so the center of the, the speaker where the cone glues to the paper, you're splitting that dynamic microphone with that line, that curve of the cone. You're exactly on it. Okay. And then the figure eight 
large diaphragm condenser is the one that's at a 45 degree angle and it's looking also towards the edge of the paper? It's looking at the basket. So where the paper connects to the actual physical metal basket okay, all right, all right, cool, of the man. speaker. Great tip. Great stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a good one. On mixing, instead of uh, putting a lot of plugs on your recorded material to um, sculpt and shape it, get a great balance and then create, um, like in Pro Tools, an aux input track. And then in parallel, taking the entire drum balance through that aux input globally affect the sound to make the sound better than what you were hearing unaffected that made you want to start inserting EQs and compressor. You use less CPU. You will also expose things that won't work in that so you can go back with your filters and your de-essers. The outcome is less plugins, less plugins, less computer computation problems from all of the different programming choices. You're making program choices. Your session file is you being a computer programmer. You're saying, I want all of these things to react this way, and my outcome is going to be rendered to this left and right data file. Right, which should sound like a number one hit record. When should I'm sound done. like a number one hit <laughs> record, and the computer's going to have a better time recreating it if it's not pushing at the threshold yeah. of its processor power. Very interesting. So the... Um, the the sand is for a parallel, did you say? Sort of a parallel addition to what you're doing? Yeah, I'd do Blend both. In slightly. So I would take the drums and I would set up different parallels with aux inputs, sometimes mono, sometimes stereo. I will set up a parallel for just the kick and snare. And I can also set up a different stereo parallel for the other components that I also might put the kick and snare in that as well. Mm -hmm. And then you use those minimally back into that balance. That's the additive part that I discussed earlier. Right, right. And then I'll globally send all of that to a single fader control. It's the concept of like, and you get this, you can work intentionally for a very focused like three hours and probably get somewhere between 70 to 80% there. Yeah. I'm talking about that last 15 to 20 percent right. and that's where all the time goes so if you do the global approach the macro approach to affecting the different components of whatever the content is you're mixing you're going to use less cpu and you can shape the individual components differently than just globally with stereo inserts on the Master Fader, which is a horrible idea in Pro Tools because all those <laughs> inserts are post-fader. Oh, are they really? Yeah. So when you do your fade at the end, yeah. it's, it's totally changing the mix. Yeah, on it's the a layout. horrible gain structure design. Well, fortunately, I rarely do I fades horrible? on my mixes anyway, yeah. right? <laughs> but if you do want to do a fade, then you create a uh, aux input, a submaster aux input to where everything goes to it, all of your stereo treatment for your final outcome is on that submaster. And then I only use analytical plugins on my master metering. Right, yeah. Just to sort of know what your final result is. Exactly. To be able to, to uh, observe it. Yep. So it reminds me a little bit of Pareto's principle, which is the otherwise known as the 80-20 rule. And uh, you're talking about, you know, that initial 20% of work that you put in, you know, gives you 80% of the results of your mix right mm -hmm. away. And that um, all that extra little stuff takes about 80% of the time to try and get at that extra little 20% of yeah. finishing out your mix. You know, and it's like, uh, uh, that's the, you made me remember the epiphany moment from uh, the aha from Richard Dodd is I was really bummed out that his mixes were so great and mine weren't. And I would I was equating the amount of time I worked to the quality of my outcome. And uh, so I would always ask him, how long does it take you to mix a song? And he would say, six hours usually. And I was just like, six hours, man. So six hours. It took me like that long to drink my coffee before yeah. I got started. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I'm like, I'm taking a day and a half, two days, two and a half, three days sometimes where I just keep, you know, now you can, and I'm doing this, and I still don't feel like I'm getting his six hours. Well, finally, after I went back and articulated that, he was like saying, well, it takes six hours of good work to get that mix. Yeah. And that was the epiphany. 
Like, so I'm looking at those two and a half days and I probably was only doing good work for about six hours. Yeah, right. And the rest of it was just messing around, taking wrong turns. Taking wrong turns, undoing what was right, discovering that, trying to get it back. You know, that step saving in your mix is is a big deal. Yeah. I always save them as versions and then I can get to a point to where I'm, I'm like, oh, wait, maybe back there at mix five, I had a lot more going, which would be basically akin to flying faders. You could go back mixing on flying faders on an analog desk and you could go back to an earlier mix and you could branch off in a new direction. Right. Yeah. So you have all of that ability in your DAW. Well, so um, Rockstars, I would remind you that um, in one DAW, the, in PreSonus Studio One, they have something, I haven't really used it yet, but they have something called the scratch pad, which is kind of cool. And I think maybe you can have multiple instances open, which would make it easier to take part of what you like about the mix that you're on now, go back to an earlier mix and just sort of copy these moves and paste them into the earlier mix. So if you wanted to sort of like stitch it together and keep going from there, branch off. That's great because uh, the workarounds for the other way. <laughs> it's a little more complicated. <laughs> a little more complicated. It's, I'm just waiting for intention software so I can just write down just what say, I intend to do <laughs> and then it just does it. And that that will be the best time saver. Yeah, I'm waiting for the same thing with assistance. No, actually, I'm <laughs> kidding. I got one. And that's a shout out to you, Nick. You're, you're amazing. Um, so, hey, let's go to the next question. I've got a few more and then I don't want to, take up too much of your time, but uh, how about a favorite hardware tool for the studio? Something physical that when you bring it to sessions, you're always glad you got it around. Could be anything. Microphones. Yep, they tend to help a lot, don't they? Yeah, they do. Um, I am at a point in my decades where I enjoy all of the physical hardware at that studio. And I kind of, uh, I, I want to go in and, and do what I do on that stuff. Um, as you well know, I used to have tons and tons and tons of stuff, ridiculous amounts. Um, where audio has gotten and the development and design in that, it's, it negates what we were having to do at that point because there was so much horrible sounding equipment made. It, right, it, you used to have to have Cartage yeah. bring over racks of stuff. Now Cartage only has to bring over your, your USB flash drive, right? Yeah, and Rockstar's Cartage is music movers. So they're basically a moving company that moves all your gear, your music gear around for you to sessions. And um, yeah, so, you know, all that hardware, as you say, it could be on a drive and you can use it in any of your multi-track system with your DAW. Yeah. Or you could just show up with a laptop and a little, you know, a digital output and you could just kind of tie right into whatever the other system yeah, I, is. I prefer to keep all of my installers and my iLock um the installer's on its own drive, as well as its authorizations on its own drive. And then all of the ones that require iLock, that iLock, and I can go into any system, throw that on and load all of my plugs onto that system, PC or Mac. And it's going to revert to my authorizations and my iLock all on that drive, and I'm working on my stuff in that system. I bet that took you a minute to figure out how to do that well. Actually, I <laughs> found a great assistant who did it. Nice. Yeah. Nice, man. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so now how about, um, now that we're talking about software, how about a favorite software tool for the studio? Something that people, uh, you know, or that you like to uh, have around and use a lot? They're tools. So, you know, I like all the tools. Um, Pro Tools is like, if you liken it to actual tools, it's Sears Craftsman. Everyone's going to have that, right? But then you get into other things like Makita and and different uh, uh, tool companies. Um, there are tools that are special to skill sets. So I'm not very uh, good in logic. I don't like the way it looks, but man, does it sound great. Mm -hmm. And for a creator, that's a great, uh, a great software. Yeah. Um, I think that live uh, is incredible for people who really want to morph and manipulate and have a whole different thing. Yeah. Um, I remember the first time I messed around with Ableton Live, I just had my earbuds and the built-in mic on my laptop and sitting waiting for my oil to be changed, you know, I was able to like compose a music out of nothing but me going into the mic and, right. and manipulate it. Right. 
I know that's kind of hard to believe, actually, the way I described it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can believe it. Just listen to Skrillex. But anyway, um, which is okay. Um, but that that type of that that's a tool for that type of mind. That tool suits that outcome. Yeah, if you don't want to bring any microphones to the session, yeah. bring Ableton Live. Yeah, I mean, it's at the point where you can you can have a great setup, and instead of being studios depending on the style of music that you're you're recording, you can just go to a lot of neat places and make records in hotel rooms or Airbnbs. I've always liked Steinberg, uh, Nuendo, and Cubase. And Studio One has a lot of uh, Steinberg mentality in the uh, in the front end of it. Dude, I had no idea you were one of the six Nuendo users in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're, we're a secret society. Um uh, I prefer Pro Tools for routing. Um, so for tracking and mixing, um, tracking Pro Tools because of all the the different like um, structures I can recreate within the system that are akin to what came before inline consoles. It operates just like an inline console. So, and it has the ability to create all those structures. I know everyone says playlists, but for me, it's routing. It has incredible routing flexibility. Um, work surface wise, I always enjoyed Steinberg and the sound of it. Pro Tools has gotten better. Mm -hmm. um, I still think it sounds better and I still think Logic sounds better than just a traditional Pro Tools setup, but it really depends on who's driving. It's the Indian, not the arrows. Right. <laughs> I like that. All right. So uh, how about um, a resource for the business side of doing this? You know, if people want to make records for a living, and they need to stay in the game. What what advice? You got any resources or tips or advice? You always uh, want to value your time. Uh, you're not being nice by not giving yourself any value. Um, so it starts there. Then you have to equate that to um, you know all these other man-made concepts like currency and ownership. The nature of business is to have value in what you're adding. So you need to ask and inform people what, what that price is. Now, they may not have that budget to work with. Richard Dodd actually gave me this, this wisdom. They might not have the budget to work with that, but you can tell them what your rate is, and you could charge them your rate for the amount of money they have. And if it's something you truly want to work on, then you can comp them the remaining time. So that when they go out and they build an audience and they have people show up at their show and somebody starts buying a t-shirt and they want to do another song, they can get closer to your rate. Right. Good point. And then you've developed the point where you are a business. It's really hard to build yourself as a business and make it a business if you do what you do for free. Right. All the time. It's not going to be uh, an industry. It, it takes some sort of commerce to fund research and development and then more commerce. Yeah. Eventually you'll have to pay the electric bill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you'll have to buy a plug-in. Yeah. And you might <laughs> even have kids to send to school one day. Well, yeah, that too. Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, good tip, man. And, and we get that advice. I hear it repeatedly on the podcast and it's one of the challenging things to do because I think when you, there's a fear that goes with doing art and music for commerce too, which is, you know, the fear that you're not going to get work or that, you know, it's not coming or that it won't be there next month or whatever. And somehow you have to strike that balance between saying, I'm going to hold, stick to what my value is and what I know it should be and put that out there and not let the, the fear of scarcity prevent me from ever placing value on yeah. my own work. So the key in that is is fear. You'll be surprised that a lot of time the fear is of actually like naming your value. So you have to get in practice of doing that. Um, so you overcome that fear. And you also have to get overcome your fear in a polite way to say where you, you make your best effort to help someone create what they want to create. And in a polite way, show them how you think it could be better, but show them first what they created. All these type of, uh, of fears are, are linked together if, the, if you want to be in that service industry of, of helping people create the art they want to create. Yeah. Um, 
you could actually create value in yourself by being a, a actual real response to what's created. You have to be engaged. You have to acknowledge that when something's great and in a polite way, you have to acknowledge when it wasn't so great. And the worst thing that you can do is be disengaged when someone asks you what you think. There are various ways to respond um, back to that type of uh, question. Um, the best, if you weren't paying attention, is to admit it. and, be, right, and say, I'm so sorry. I was, I was zoned out for a I was thinking about you're probably going to want lunch and what's close. If you don't mind, if you play me this section, I'll tell you. You know, be honest. Honesty then gives you value. Yeah. Maybe don't be thinking about lunch for all 12 hours of your session, though, you know. Yeah, just say <laughs> I need a minute to eat some tortilla chips. Nice, man. All right, now how about um, an organizational online resource? Is there anything that you find you're using online that helps you just kind of keep it all organized and together? Mm, meaning for business? Uh, just, yeah, for business, for production, for, you know. I mean, I use the calendar like crazy, probably too much in my phone. I use yeah. all sorts of online tools. I just wondered if, you know, here you are making number one records. How do you keep everything straight and not sort of uh, be scattered? One of the best investments for that has been devices first, but then a decent cloud that I like that functions really well. And I can keep everything that is going on there. So if I forgot that drive... Or someone needs, I, it, it's strange, but I've finished tracking sessions with people who have gone on to another place in the world. They're like, I got a day and there's a great studio and I want to play some guitar on the thing we just cut and I don't have it. So I can send that uncompressed on my terabyte cloud. The engineer can grab that. They can work. And I could take those files back, again, uncompressed at the bit depth and sample rate of the session, put those back into the master. So when that person who's out touring or doing whatever it is that they're away from, it's there when they get back. Um, Any particular cloud tools that you use? Dropbox. Dropbox. Uh, I got on uh, Dropbox when it was a beta. And I've just really been impressed. I use it as well in education. as, um, And that's the, the remote... You can have a specific group working on the same thing. And if you all have the same software and a similar plug set, you can literally finish your work, put it in that session. Someone else, you, you use a unique identifier that it's your work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your last name's great right. or initials. Yeah. Um, Maybe and, you can put the date in the, in it, the save as title. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, and it, hopefully they're savvy enough. They see that, right? But they can open that up then on their end and they can add to that when they're completed. This works incredible if you work with someone in Australia or New Zealand because by the time you finish, they're getting up. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, you can produce pretty quickly. Yeah. 24-hour sessions. Yeah. All right, cool, man. Now, so, now, so now we'll get into a hypothetical question. We're just, just about done. Imagine you're starting over again. You move into a, a new place. You need a simple setup to record. You need to find people to make music with and record, and you got to make ends meet. What would you suggest? Mm, another career. <laughs> another career. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, like, let's say no. you got some some young student who's just right. you know wants to get started in this. Somebody wants to get started. How do they? What should, do they need? Incredibly expensive. I mean, I'm, how many faders are on that mixing console right next to us over there? Like you know, do we need hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars? And uh, how do we find people? No. And then how do we uh, actually pay those electric bills and eat food while we're doing this? The advice I give that person is to not put their, not to go into debt or put their money into things that they're that are not going to appreciate or depreciate on a schedule to um, their income that doesn't make sense. So buying an actual structure that you can live in, and if you are a young person and you're single, that you can actually uh, rent rooms out, or if you're in an area that's high demand and you can get a permit, you can, people coming through that don't want to stay in hotels, you create another type of income source. That's the key. 
So you want to create stability around your career that you're wanting to start. Um, microphones, after you have an actual computer and software and then an interface, then you're going to need a microphone. I believe at this point there are hardware pieces that do software emulation in real time. UAD and RME uh, make great ones. And I would have to believe that the Apollo mixer is third partied from RME because it looks awfully a lot like Hammerfall. Right. Um, and operates like Hammerfall. And they do the same thing where you can do real time emulation in your recording. So that type of interface with a microphone you're off and running, then you have to have a network. So you've got to go out and find talent. You have to go to the places where extroverts are trying to display their talent. Well, you described the smell of that place for you. It was an old vinyl record store. You yeah. Know? You go meet people there and start start connecting with other people who love That's, music. The, yeah, that play. And then making ends meet. Um, I guess you kind of answered that too, which is just try and balance it out with things that are outside of music if you, if and as you need to. If people are approaching you, wanting you to create with them, go back to the business advice of establishing a value. When you're at the point where that's sustainable, then you probably don't need something else. But until that point, you've got to think about how do I minimize this thing I want to do damage on my actual ability to survive. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that whole struggle of desperation undoes the best plan. That's a good point. That's, that's insightful. All right. Here's our closing question. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you got to go. If you could go back and meet young Joe mm -hmm. and give young Joe some advice, one bit of advice, and you wanted to tell yourself, here's the one single thing you need to know to become a rock star of the recording studio, what would you say? Try listening first. As opposed to feeling an obligation to put forward a comment or to set back a bit and see what's happening and then only feel led to offer when you feel strongly enough to speak instead of offering first, um, assuming that everyone's looking to you for direction. You know, an analogy that I find myself running into all the time is when I'm having conversations with people and in between one thought and the next one, I go, um, uh, you know, it's almost like I'm afraid to have nothing happen right there and I'm just right. filling the space. And I think that sort of reminds me of what you're talking about, which is initially the sense that I'm around people doing something and I'm supposed to fill it up. I'm supposed to prove that I've got something. Yeah, that's exactly perfect. Everything you just said there. You're on the team. You're there. And it's okay for it to be quiet. You go back to an earlier point, which you asked about number ones. I can pick up something special has happened. I don't know what the business is going to be, but you will get in creative moments where no one's talking. And those are the best moments. So everybody's doing what they're doing. And you, even moving forward is not communicated. It's just always forward. What's the deal? Always forward. Right. Right. The first thing that is said is let's stop and listen to that. Everyone's going. Everyone's on the team. Everyone's trying to do whatever that team's purpose is, right? Whatever their score is, whatever their goal is. Well, I like that. I don't know if I'm supposed to say anything right now. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, thanks so much for being here on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. My thanks guest today me. has been Joe Baldrich. You rock, dude. Will Thank you tell you. the Rockstars rock. how to find you and, and learn more about what you're doing? And uh, maybe let them know how they can find out about this beautiful studio we're in since we didn't really get much of a chance to talk about it. Yeah, OceanwayNash.com, I think is it. But if you look up Oceanway Nashville, uh, Alan Sides and Gary Bells um, started this place. Mike Kerb who's been a great person here in Nashville, purchased the facility from them and then gave it to the university as an endowment. So um, it's basically, it's a commercial studio and a great commercial studio. And Mike Kerb has preserved many studios 
and been a part of groups of people who have had great success giving back to the community by preserving these type of spaces. This is a fully functioning, making hit records every day facility. And you should look at it. It's in a beautiful church. Uh, it was a church that had an orphanage next door. And when I came here, it was fully hundreds of years forward from that point. There was a crazy guy in here basically starting a cult. I was uh, hoping we were going to get to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, there's a place downstairs where there's a reverb chamber where he had his frozen dead wife that he would consult for leadership. Um, wow. So there's lots of things going on here from orphanage days and then a few hundred years forward. I'm um, getting into 300 years. Probably not that, like, uh, you know, 100 years later. Rock having, stars, you can't make this shit up. You can't make this real. shit up. Yeah, yeah. There's a guy... Um, and ended up going to prison, running a cult here, talking to his frozen dead wife. Wow, that's intense. Well, <laughs> you want? I wanted to know how you make hit records. No, 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 no. <laughs> you stay away from. You that. just got to start a hundred years ago with a little bit of wildness. <laughs> this the facility is uh, beautiful, and uh, it's a great acoustical space. And uh, when you look, when you stand in what was the church, and you look. Uh, at the direction of the control room, there are photos of that online. It sort of looks like like the Starship Enterprise, right. which is pretty cool. Spaces that are fun are generally creative, like your place. Thanks, dude. I appreciate that. You got to come yeah. over. Oh, I'd love to. You're teaching at Belmont and... and so they uh, can find me as a faculty member at Belmont University. I'm on Facebook. Um, you can look at different things that I've done on all music and i Appear sometimes here and there with I should, the thing, times I should be quiet. I'm not. And <laughs> people put things up. I say so. Nice man. You well, you'd it. be known for things you say. That's kind of cool. Anyway, right? <laughs> fill up gear sl sluts with uh, with famous quotes from from Joe. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool man. Well, anyway, thank you so much for being here with us, dude. Just totally fantastic. I Thanks know for um, me. I'm going to be psyched myself to just go back and listen to all this because you shared so much great stuff. And we will see you more around the studio. Yay! All right, dude. Cheers, man. Cheers. Enjoy, rock stars. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rock Stars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.